So without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome Richard Edelman. Thank you, this all works now. I wanna go right to the uh, slides if I could uh, and set the uh, context. Uh, Margaret was correct in saying that uh, when I presented in February, the data was entirely different. Uh, we've had a fundamental change in the trust landscape in the last three months. And in short, we've never seen such a large change in such a short period of time. For instance, after 2001, after 9-11, uh, after uh, 2008, the Great Recession, we saw nothing like the rearrangement of uh, order of trust and institutions. So next slide. The first thing to say um, is that, in fact, trust in all institutions has risen in the last months. And we were in 11 countries doing this study with 13,000 people who fall into two categories, mass population and so-called informed elites, and those informed are 75K plus in income, four plus media day, college plus educated. 15% of the total sample is those, and the rest is mass population. So on this slide, two major points. Trust increases across all four institutions in all parts of the world. So we were in Asia, China, India, Korea, and Japan. We were in North America, US, Canada, uh, and Mexico. We're also in Europe, UK, France, Germany. And this data was actually from last week of April and first week of May, and here we have the data today. Um, so two key points on this slide. One is that, in fact, trust in all institutions has risen. It's the highest point we've ever been at in the so-called trust index, which is the average of trust across business, media, NGOs, and government. The other point to make from this uh, slide is that the divide between mass opinion and that of the elites has never been wider and nor has it ever been more transversal. So in countries that used to be very small divides, such as Germany, Canada, now we have big divides and it's also now into developing markets, India, Saudi Arabia, et cetera. So in fact, this is a potential future uh, destabilizer uh, and you'll see more data on that in a moment. Next slide. <clears throat> the important point to make is we believe this to be a trust bubble, as if somehow uh, the great ship Titanic has hit the iceberg, lifeboats are lowered, you've gotten into a lifeboat, that feels pretty good relative to the ocean, but now you have to row to the shore. We believe that by Christmas, a lot of the air will come out of this bubble, and that uh, in fact, the double digit trust gains that have happened in the last three months will actually compress. And we've seen this in past years, almost universally, when there's huge trust gain in short time, followed by trust loss. And we think, in fact, it's going to be the collision of business and government over the uh, going back to work. And there'll be a blame game about the new incidence of disease and whose fault, et cetera. Next slide. <clears throat> the important point about the next three slides, there are still very important fears that are on people's minds. The key point here is new big concern about my health. Neither government nor business is doing a great job. Government, I'm getting me good treatment and supplies, business on worker protection. So health is fear number one. And you'll recall, we came into this trust season with fears in our head, next slide, about job loss. On the left-hand side, in January, I told you that the big new fear is loss of job to automation. And people are scared about workforce restructuring, fourth industrial revolution, globalization. All those are still there. Here's the new one. I'm gonna lose my job because of the pandemic. More than half the people, 56% believe this. So big fear on this. Next slide. Fake news is making it unable for me to get to the truth. Again, this battle for truth has been an issue really since 2016, when social media contributed to the election of the president, um, meaning that it caused a sense of, I can't quite get to the facts, media is politicized, I, so I rely on social, but I don't really trust it. So half the people find it very hard to get reliable information about the coronavirus. 
two thirds of people believe there's a lot of fake news in the system. So that adds to instability. Next slide. But the biggest fear, and this is one that I wanna to continue to harp on is social inequities, mass class divide. The left hand statistic, something has to be done to more fairly distribute our country's wealth and prosperity, two thirds. Two thirds also say those with less education, less money and fewer resources are being unfairly burdened, taking on most of the suffering, risk of illness and need to sacrifice due to pandemic. In other words, Hispanics in the US, for example, 50% are now either out of work or have significantly reduced hours. And so that is an indicator. In Chicago also, a five to one death rate for African Americans over people uh, who are Anglo um, in the last three months. Um, it's a unfair world is how people see it. Next. <clears throat> So here's the money slide of the presentation. We have a complete reordering of trust. The landscape is altered, maybe not permanently, but substantially. The big riser in the last three months has been government. Government is seen as all knowing, all believed and all powerful. So specifically, why is it that three quarters of people say, of course I'll comply with lockdowns? Two thirds of people willingly giving up their cell phone information so that government can track movement. No problem. We're in this world of COVID, we trust government. Government is for the first time in the 20 years we have looked at this, the most trusted institution, followed by NGO, business and media. You'll note that every one of them rose but that government was the one that had the rocket ship up. And this was universally so, except with a couple of caveats. Next slide. And that slide is the United States because government, the federal government trust went up in every country, every country except the US and Japan. So nine out of 11 countries. You'll note that this is a political lens more than anything else. So in the US, among Democrats, a minus five for government, a plus 10 for the Republicans in the federal government. Local and state government is the hero for both Republicans and Democrats. But look at the difference between state and local and federal for Democrats, it's 33 points. Whereas for Republicans, it's only six. So again, in California, in Illinois, in New York, you have governors who have taken up a lot of the stage and they are blue state and they are also Democrats. So it's important to note the difference. Um, I also want you to look at the difference in media. For Democrats, and this is consistent with January, the trust in media is very high. It's the most trusted institution. For Republicans, it's the least trusted institution at 35. So it's almost, it's a 30 point difference uh, in, between Republicans and Democrats about media. So the only other huge difference is among NGOs for Democrats, again, very highly trusted Republicans, not so much. So again, Alice in Wonderland, two ends of the telescope, America profoundly divided. We have to talk to both sides equally. Next. The mandate for government is universal. It is contain the pandemic, inform the public, provide economic relief, help people cope and actually get the country, sorry, go back one, um, and get the country back to normal. You should have thought, for instance, provide economic relief and support might be a business thing. No, 30 points difference between government and business. Inform the public. You should have thought that might be media. No, it is government. So it's the Anthony Fauci briefing and not just what you read in the newspaper. Next slide. The news business has actually benefited substantially in this period. So the trust level in traditional media has jumped. Again, this is across the world and it's because they're doing a really good job of covering the problem. Social media has hardly budged. Social media continues to be 25 points less trusted than 
uh, traditional. Even if it is the first port of call for young people, it is not trusted alone. It has to be supplemented. And I want you to note the rise of owned media. One of the suggestions we're actually making for Michael Fosnacht about the city of Chicago is, given the shrinking number of reporters in traditional media, Chicago needs to be its own media company in a certain way and provide its own news. Next. <clears throat> Expert voices. This is classically true in crisis. And who we believe now are those with credentials. Doctors, scientists, national health organizations. Note the 22 point difference between a person like yourself and a doctor or a scientist. Remember in January, a person like yourself was at the very highest end with a technical expert. So again, we've seen a big change it's mostly a rise in trust for those who have credentials. Next slide. Trust in NGOs. NGOs are an important element in this mix because they are able to deliver services locally. But the trust levels for NGOs are much higher in developing markets than they are in developed. And again, this is a phenomenon of the last five to seven years. No differences here. Next slide. And the reason is NGOs are not seen as very good at execution. Uh, they are good at raising uh, money, but not getting things done. So competence is lacking. Next slide. This is the money part of the presentation. And it's not just because it's about business. It's because for business, this is the moment of reckoning. This is the crucible. This is going to be the period that people are going to remember for a long time. Because at the moment, business has been in that comfortable place of number two or number three in the bike peloton. The lead rider with the yellow jersey has been government, breaking the wind, taking up the elements, and we've been able to sort of go at three quarters pace and sort of keep up with the leader. The next period of time, once there's a back to work order, business is going to have to ride in the front and certainly equal, if not ahead, of government. It's not going to be able to go in the shield of government because we're all going to have to make decisions about how do we organize the quick serve restaurant footprint? How do we um, go to A, B, and A or B shifts at work? There are companies such as FedEx that have had to operate through this um, because they're urgent uh, delivery of medical supplies, etc. But for many of us who have been, you know, sheltering at home, it's going to be the moment of reckoning. Next slide. And business is getting not such good grades because we've been so quiet. Two thirds of people say, I want CEOs to lead and not wait for government to impose restrictions and demands. But only 29% say CEOs are doing an outstanding job meeting the demands placed on them by the pandemic. Lower than journalists, lower than heads of NGOs, much lower than academics, and much lower than national government leaders. In short, this is a major reversal since January, where you'll recall that CEO trust was on the rise and that business, in fact, had stepped into the void left by government. Not now. Next slide. In fact, business is failing at what it does best, which is competence, ensuring that the products and services people need are available, protecting essential employees, preparing for the recovery. We don't know how United Airlines, for instance, is gonna run its business forward. Do we wear masks on the airplane? Do we have temperature checks? Is there some sort of safety protocol for going to a Hilton, like a health passport? We have no idea because business hasn't come forward with a plan. People don't like lack of plans. They want surety. They want to see business ahead of, not behind the curve. Next slide. Also, they want business to have integrity. And that means looking out for your employees and your business partners, specifically helping your small companies in your supply chain, giving them credit terms or other, and protecting your employees' jobs and financial well being. Most important, putting people before profits. We're not doing well on competence nor on integrity. That's bad for trust for business. Next slide. 
to do better on trust in the next period, we have to be seen as getting the right equipment to cure COVID, collaborate if we need to with competitors, switch production from what we currently make. The Louis Vuitton, you know, we'll make uh, sanitizers instead of perfume. And lastly, perhaps most important, let's be sure that the company's purpose is about stakeholder, not just shareholder. Urgent, long-term capitalism, what we signed at the business roundtable last August has to now be shown to work in practice. Next. The greatest trust gains have come from the frontline industries. Food, healthcare, pharma is up a stunning 25%. Healthcare is a big, big tent. We've checked pharma, pharma is up 25%. Uh, in fact, healthcare and food have now eclipsed tech for the first time ever in 20 years in the Edelman study. And uh, so you'll note that most industries went up a little bit. The big jumps were CPG, food, and healthcare, where somehow they're seen as making our lives better. Next slide. Business can't do this alone. This is gonna be a dual bike race. Health authorities should be the ones making the decision on back to work, not CEOs. And really note this one. Three quarters of people say, be conservative about going back to normal operations. We have to wait until the virus is under control. Next slide, which is reiterated by this slide by two to one. People say government's highest priority, save as many lives as possible, even if it means the economy sustains damage versus the one third who say, start the economy, save jobs. Next slide. There are demands of government for the future also. More spend on healthcare, required healthcare screenings. Big, big one, don't have international travel. Don't expose us to risk and ensure that we have enough medical supplies in this country. In fact, another stat, 60% of people said, if you're a multinational company and you're the CEO, make sure that we, the headquarters company, of the company we, that we get the products first. We don't care about your multinational challenges. So a 3M kind of question where President Trump called them out, people basically say by six out of 10, bring the products to the US. Sorry about the customers in Asia. That's a bad thing. Next slide. So our assessment is that in fact, on a two by two, where the x-axis is competence and the y-axis is ethical behavior. Business has gone backwards in the last three months, especially on competence. And government has gone up in both ethical behavior and in competence. If present trends continue, government will be in the top right corner uh, for January of next year. We're dubious that that will happen. We do think that business will recover on competence and has the opportunity to excel on ethics, but it comes all down to return to work. Next slide. So this moment of reckoning, we think that we need to be doing tangible, specific steps that prove that we are putting people ahead of profits. Specifically, if you're in the QSR business, please have a different store layout, have clear PPE for your workers, make sure that there's six foot spacing for customers um, getting uh, product, just as an example. Business and government collaborating instead of arguing about solutions. Don't be in a place where business is pushing government to open too quickly. Follow and then implement really well. Third, live up to the multi-stakeholder. We've got to take care of our employees, also of our smaller suppliers. Small business is getting crushed in the moment. And um, lastly, I really want to emphasize this idea of CEOs and public leadership. CEOs have been head down, working to make sure that their businesses are viable, maybe speaking to their employees, but not speaking to the public. One statistic, there have been 400 op-eds in the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and New York Times in the last four weeks. Two were from CEOs. That's not good enough. We need to tell people what we're doing. We can't assume in the fog of war that anybody has any sense of what's happening unless we speak up. And the last is this return to work is the moment for business to shine. Let's make sure that everybody appreciates that we're putting health and safety first, that we are reinventing our businesses, that we can make money 
It's a long-term effort and that we care deeply about our customers and our employees more than our shareholders. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Richard. Everyone's on. You can see everyone. Fantastic. So we're going to get into it. Remember, put your questions in the Q&A, but we have a bunch of stuff that we want to talk about. So Michael, I'd like to start with you because you're in a unique position having worked with corporate brands for much of your career and now as the CMO for the city of Chicago. So first, are you surprised that government is the leading institution in trust? I would say yes or no. Yes, it's very normal because government and its key leaders matter. Government decides right now, can you go out for a jog and how? Are you wearing a facial covering or not? How do you get your coffee? So I think government matters more than ever before in the decisions that our government leaders do. Second, I think you see a difference with some of the government leaders. And I think the mayor of Chicago has done a great job of both focusing on making decisions based on data and science, a very rational, very logical approach to decision making that impact all of us, but also show a human side. Because if a leader only plays kind of the rational side of all the communications, but doesn't come across as human with humor, with emotions, with, with this whole dimensions that we all have, I think people don't believe and don't trust you. Um, and that, that leads to what Richard alluded to for us as, as uh, in the mayor's office and, and city hall is very challenging because suddenly we become almost a publisher of the brand of the mayor and the strategy and thoughts and actions of the mayor office. So we have to think more like a publisher of what are the strategic ways of, of creating our content. And I think as well, the COVID-19 crisis has shown us, despite the increasing trust in our leaders, a massive communication challenge. Meaning we don't reach a lot of our residents in Chicago because they don't consume traditional media. That's why we focus so much on our social media accounts. You will go nicely, but we're also looking at hyper-local outreach. I think any brand and a leader really has to understand how do I reach truly all my constituents and not just a small sub part? Mm -hmm. So local government in particular has increased significantly, especially compared to federal government levels. You talked about the communication with the community. Is there anything else that the mayor's office is doing in particular that you believe is contributing to this greater level of trust in local government? I think we really try almost every day, what is, how do we talk and how do we distribute our content? I think when we saw, we saw a five-fold increase in our social media following the last six or seven weeks, mostly because we're bringing almost every day something that's relevant from a content perspective for your life, but also in a tonality that's engaging, that's interesting, that you want to share and show your mom or your dad. I think mm -hmm. you have to be as a government person, you can't just have a dry rational press conference anymore in today's world, you will not read, especially the young audience in our young African-American and Latinx communities. We need to think in different ways. So when you saw the mayor on TikTok, that's not just a cute thing. It has strategic intent to reach audiences that normally don't listen to government. Yeah, the mayor has become a national, if not international meme. She rose very early on the public stage using her humor and her personality to build trust during this crisis. Why has that been so powerful? And what does that tell us about what people are yearning for right now? I think first of all, it's authentic. Um, um, she, she is funny. Uh, our mayor is, is, is a great sense of humor. So we can't fabricate something that is not there. And secondly, if you see some of the messaging, I think some of our audience get tired of just all the negative dry information they're tuning out. You have to weigh new tonalities to break through. I think that's the combination of authenticity and relevance. Um, that's why I think she became much more like a national international figure. Mm -hmm. So Brie, is this different than what FedEx believes its customers are needing to hear and see in this moment? No, not, not at all. Um, I think what Michael just said, and I just wrote it down, is you can't fabricate who you are in the midst of a global pandemic. Um, we really believe quite strongly that the brands and the companies that lead with purpose, integrity prior to the pandemic 
are going to be those brands that will have trust kind of accelerate and increase. You know, for us, the three things that we get asked in, in, about the most often, um, number one, what are we doing for our employees? How are we keeping them safe? Number two, how are we helping the broader community? What is our role as an essential service in delivering healthcare? And number three is what are we doing, as Richard mentioned, for small business? Well, the good news for us is that we are a people company. You're, our operating philosophy, philosophy is people, service, profit. You can't make that up and then tell employees that in the middle of a pandemic. They have to believe that. Um, and we have, as a result, you know, of course, put everything possibly in place that we could, as Richard talked about, you know, we're very unique and that we've had to continue to operate. Um, we have obviously made dramatic changes to our operations. You know, we spent tens and tens of millions of dollars on PPE. We've created new SOPs. We've done a lot. Um, we're no longer asking consumers to get signatures. Um, we're diverting traffic to balance out the network so that we can have people separated um, as they're sorting packages. So first and foremost, we had to change our operating, but our integrity and our principles that guide us on how we treat employees did not change. Secondly, mm -hmm. you know, and what was really interesting for me is within um, what Richard just shared was this view that NGOs cannot get things done. And I think that is where FedEx has certainly excelled. We have moved over 17,000 tons um, of PPE since February 1st. We have donated 175 tons. We have donated 1,500 shipments, 4 million masks, a million um, suits uh, and gloves and swabs. Um, and we've been able to do that because one of our core um, principles, our FedEx CARES program is delivering for good. We have those relationships with local government all over the world and with the NGOs who do know how to get things done. We've been working with direct relief for gosh probably 20 years now and so you know we had that expertise and we're able to leverage that that's not something you build in the moment the moment of panic and emergency you have to have that those decades of expertise so we've been able to leverage that and then thirdly when we think about small business again you know one of our guiding commercial principles is that you need complete goal congruency with your customers what do i mean that by that when they succeed you succeed. Um, and we have been working with small businesses for many years. This is our eighth annual small business grant contest. We didn't dream up a grant contest in the middle of COVID. We had one. Now we put more money in this year. We added a million dollars to that fund. Um, but you have to have those principles. And I think that's the companies that are going to see a movement and trust are those that had integrity and purpose prior to the pandemic. Yeah, you shared that with me earlier when we were talking earlier this week. You said, if you didn't know your purpose or what you stood for during it, going into this, you're certainly not going to figure it out during a crisis. No, <laughs> absolutely right. That's not something you can make up on the fly. And quite frankly, you know, I often say this. I had a two-year plan when I joined FedEx. Well, I'm coming up on 20 years. Um, you know, I stayed and I work at FedEx because of the integrity of the leadership, because of the integrity of our founder and our CEO. You know, to Michael's point, I can't fabricate integrity for Fred Smith. He lives and breathes his purpose every single day, and that makes my job a whole lot easier. So one of Richard's big five insights coming out of this, tangible action is needed to preserve trust for the long term. So if you can share very tangibly, and you already did give some examples, but things that brands need to be doing even more of right now than they thought they needed to do even just three months ago to have long-term impact on building trust. Yeah. Oh, obviously, the first thing that we need to do, and we've always believed this, is we have 475,000 employees. They are, they live and breathe our brand. Um, it doesn't matter what I put in my social media feed or on my website. If I employees do not live what we call the purple promise, which is to make every FedEx experience outstanding, if they don't believe that, everything else I come to work today to do is kind of irrelevant. So the first thing that we obviously prioritized is making sure that our employees did feel comfortable, that they understood that they are heroes. And I don't say that in any sort of cliche way to come to work every day um, and to ask them to deliver packages. They are heroes because they are doing that. And yes, they are nervous. Yes, there is anxiety. Um, yes, they're asking questions about you know, how to adjust. And so our first 
you know, operating principle from day one is to make sure that we answered those questions, that we were as transparent throughout this as possible. I'll give you a great example of that, is that when we do have an employee um, who uh, gets COVID, we are very open and honest with anyone that wants that information. Now we're obviously not naming names because we're going to protect the privacy of that employee, but we're very open and honest and direct. We take feedback. That's been something that's one of our, our people philosophies is we take feedback and we close that loop. So I think that's been really important. And of course, we've made numerous operating changes um, to accommodate people. Um, I guess the other thing from a brand perspective that we pivoted and we recognized you know, it's, we do a lot of work from a brand perspective in measuring emotion of our customers. We do not believe that customers make always rational decisions and you really have to understand their feelings in designing um, solutions, whether those digital or physical. And so I would say the other big change that we did from a brand and a communications perspective is we rewrote a ton of content. Um, empathy is incredibly important. It is not rational how people are feeling and behaving. Um, and so we, number one, went through and redid all of our advertising. We produced all new commercials. We rewrote content right through the website to really make sure that our tone is connecting right now because some of what our customers are feeling isn't rational and that's okay. Um, we need to respond um, in a place of empathy and recognize, you know, the anxiety of our employees, of our customers, and quite frankly, even our leaders. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking about this idea of long-term and lasting impact and that people will remember how you handle this moment from the CEO all the way down. How is this current situation a real opportunity for further strengthening your brand in a post-COVID environment? Well, I guess for us, one of the things that has been, um, you know, and of course we're a logistics company, um, but with the growth of e-commerce, uh, you know, the way that we operate is not always visible. Um, quite often you come home and there's a package on your front door and you don't think, oh, well, thanks FedEx. You think that's great. There's my package and, and you move on with your day. But we really think that there is going to be a recognition um, and a more balanced conversation about companies and how they treat people versus just their digital experiences. We have certainly noticed that there was this taking for granted of the physical. You know, we, we often talk about the fact that nobody really cares about the movement of atoms anymore. Um, so for us, we think that how people treat their employees and that role will really reposition. And we saw that even, um, you know, when you looked at the categories, you know, a lot of those movement where trust increased in business was where they do have essential workers. So I think that that'll be really important and there'll be a lot of light um, shed on companies who might have great um, products and services, but are not operating with integrity. And so for FedEx, we feel very confident about how we operate every day, but we think that will shift the conversation about what makes a valuable company for the long run. Thank you. Dan, thank you for being here. You are a CEO. This idea that business must live up to its multi-stakeholder promise. We've all been familiar with this commitment to stakeholder value over shareholder value. A lot was done around the business roundtable. What it has been like for you as a CEO needing to balance the needs of these multiple stakeholders? You have your employees, your customers, the business itself, you know, your investors. Share with us a little bit how you're managing all that. Yeah, first, let me just say, Mark, thank you for sponsoring this from Fifth Third Bank and Richard, outstanding job. And Bree, I'll just say this, uh, FedEx is very lucky to have you on the team these 20 plus years. So um, we are a member of the Business Roundtable and have been for a long time. Uh, we, we sponsored and were a big part of endorsing and putting our signature on the pack that was rolled out. There were certain pockets of investors that wouldn't necessarily appreciate uh, appreciate the approach that was taken, that there would be a, a very uh, well-balanced approach to how we go to market, keeping our customers at top of mind, all the stakeholders, the customers, our employees, of course, the shareholders, and our communities. And I think it's just incredibly ironic that as we sit here today with COVID-19 impacting everyone around the world, what a great time to have been on the record for doing the right thing. So, when I think about it as a CEO, our first priority was trying to get our employees to a safe and healthy environment as soon as possible. 
and we relocated 18,000 employees to their a place of choice, in most cases, homes, within three days. 95% were within three days. And that's pretty remarkable because our customer service scores continue to rank among some of the very best. And so not only do the employees work from home, they've crushed it in terms of you know, servicing our customers, which makes me incredibly proud. And, and again, Michael said this, and Richard certainly emphasized it. Bree talked about it. If you didn't have good core values going into this, then I don't think it's possible because I think our employees and our customers had an appreciation of what our best intent was. What, what was the intent? Yeah, there was a couple of days, probably a little bit rough, call center delays, some of those different things. But I think we got a little bit of a pass because they knew from having been in this business now for 141 years that with grace, we were going to try to do all the right things for our employees. So then the customers, uh, we, we have three groups that we really pay top of mind to. We have 200,000 small to medium sized customers, but it isn't just the small employer because they have uh, cohorts of employees that are negatively impacted. For example, there's a lot of gig workers out there today. A large percentage of the success of this country and around the world is made up of gig workers. We support the very largest employers and the small employers. They get the same priority for us to support the gig worker. The second is those people who are just riddled with student loans. I mean, think about a time you're out of a job, you need your retirement dollars, you're, you're trying to make ends meet and student loans have become a bit of a, 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 a problem for a large percentage of the population. We have certain programs to help them navigate that. The last one I'm embarrassed to say this is a society. One of the groups that is worried the most are people who are gonna to live too long. And that's sad that you could outlive your wealth or you didn't have the proper protection. So we actually identify a very important part of our customer base. They're older, they're seniors, they need a lot of help. How to navigate, not only through kind of a normal retirement, but how do you navigate in one in which you've been decimated potentially within your investment portfolios, you've been decimated in terms of your ability to have uh, choices about what you do each and every day. So once we secured our customers and our employees, the next step we took was around community. Uh, collectively, I should say, between what we did for our customers and did for our communities, the number's about 25 million. We identified 30 countries around the world, 30, I'm sorry, 30 specific cities around the world. And we went and worked with local uh, not-for-profits and we worked with local small uh, women-owned and minority-owned restaurants and catering firms to provide hot meals to those people who needed one. And we did it with abandonment and we created a connection called the Giving Link to try to encourage other people to participate. And so not only were we able to help drive revenue dollars into these restaurants and catering firms, but it helped the community. The other thing uh, we did, and, I'll, and then I'll pause, we tried to ensure that there are certain uh, support groups that support principal financial group, custodial workers, food service workers, security people. These are individuals that were furloughed during the process. And even though there was gonna be uh, support through workman's comp, I'm sorry, through unemployment and other means, they needed money quickly. And so we put a, a, a grant program in immediately, not for our employees, but for those service providers that work closely with principal all these years to say, we wanna make this money available to you to help them navigate what is a very uncertain time for people who are furloughed, but they service our employees every day. We know them, uh, but we, we made a decision to hire people who are professionals at custodial services, food service and security. So maybe I'll pause there Margaret, to see if there's another question. Sure, so let's review some of the statistics from the barometer. Fewer than two in five people believe the following, that business is doing well putting people before profits, just 38%, that business is doing well at protecting their employees' financial well-being and safeguarding their jobs, just 39%, and that business is helping their smaller suppliers and business customers stay in business, by either extending them credit or giving them more time to pay, just 38%. So these are not great numbers for business. 
you shared some of the tangible things that principal is doing in terms of supporting its communities, its employees, its customers, its investors, as well as, frankly, public trust in the financial industry itself. But for those who are watching, they're struggling balancing this. And some are arguing that these could be competing you know, needs and how do they do this in this moment? They want to keep their company viable. They want to keep people employed. They want to keep people safe. They want to get them back to work. Uh, and it's a lot to balance on any day, let alone during a global pandemic crisis. So as someone who is leading your company through this, what insights do you have to share on how to balance all of this? Yeah, so as I look at my fellow panelists, my guess is we were all uh, in a senior position back in 08 and 09. And let's face it, very few times in the course of a 35 or 40 year career, do you get two seismic uh, events that have happened within your career and I've been telling my people for 10 years, and my leaders, of which I think I've got a phenomenal leadership team, you've been honed. I mean, you were built for this moment because you thrived in 08 and 09. So I think we do have leaders that are capable of doing this. We've extended, uh, certainly extended loans. We've, we've waived fees. We've extended grace periods. We've done everything we possibly could think of to try to make sure to take care of our customers. And my guess is Richard could support this, but I, I think we need to just hit the pause button for half a minute and understand that some of these statistics are really a challenging because they're averages. There are industries like financial services that made what I'd consider to be small adjustments. We don't have big manufacturing floors. We're not in the, we're not in the hospitality business. We're not in the uh, transportation business. And this is a really barbelled sort of, of, of uh, pandemic. And th in other words, some businesses are actually doing quite well, making good on community promises, employee promises, customer promises. I don't think those other companies that have had large furloughs are bad companies. They're anything but. But their business model did not allow them to make the choices I know they really wanted to make. So that's all of our problem. And so that's why, for example, in our giving chain, we wanted to support restaurants. So how do the companies that didn't get undermined so significantly, how do we play our part to help drive the economy in a positive way forward? We do business in 80 countries around the world and the, the stricken industries are, are very similar wherever you go, right? It's Qantas. It's it's Hilton Hotels, it's, it's those organizations. They're great companies, great brands. They want to do the right thing, but they're struggling to be viable in this environment. The good news is we'll look back a year from now and we will have lived through another crisis. We will be, we will be more appreciative, more, uh, conv more conviction about our core values. And I suspect all of us will be better people on the other end of this, but it's, it doesn't feel like it today. And I'll open it up to the rest of the panelists to address this too, how you're managing these multiple stakeholders that sometimes may feel competing. And Richard, you're on the front lines of this with many of your clients. You're on mute, Richard. Look, I think the, the key test for um, taking care of your employees is making sure that you have third party independent health experts to corroborate your change in plan. And I'm sure that FedEx consulted with CDC and others about the right amount of equipment and spacing and signature, no signature, um, because the lack of belief is epic. And the suspicion that is engendered by social commentator, commentary. And so, I mean, my favorite story of this uh, crisis is um, there's a rumor that got around, started in Malaysia about ice cream. It opens your throat to COVID because it's cold. And ice cream sales plunged for a, a month before the science people got out and said, come on, that's ridiculous. But my point is, whatever we do as business or government, we have to be led by health officials. And so, you know, Dr. Fauci yesterday was so important in leading the conversation back to a rational discussion about how to go forward. Baby steps, not crazy steps. 
And so employees want to believe their employer, but they have in the back of their heads a suspicion of, well, maybe they're pushing me to work because they have to go make money first. And we can't have that. We have to be sure it's health and then business together, not one or the other. Mm -hmm. So Quaylen, McKinsey has been putting out some tremendous real-time reports and insights that the impact that COVID-19 is having on business and institutions during this time. Thank you. I know a lot of people are relying on the work that you're doing. What would you say are the most striking insights that you have uncovered, particularly for those businesses here in the US and even in the Midwest? Yeah. I think the economic impact has been considerable. And keep in mind, um, as Dan was describing it, it's not just the impact of COVID. It is also a record low interest rate environment and also a lot of volatility in the market, right? For those who are nearing retirement, that's of uh, acute stress. Um, but overall, we find that the impact from COVID is not uh, an average impact. It's very concentrated in some industries and some occupations. So almost half of the industry impact is in accommodation and food services, as well as retail. And we saw a lot of those early impacts in terms of unemployment claims, right? The 33 plus million unemployment claims over the last five, six weeks uh, and unemployment claim numbers come out again tomorrow. Um, so industry-wise, it's very concentrated there. And then occupation-wise, a similar pattern, uh, very concentrated in four occupations. So food services, customer service and sales, office support, so admins, as well as production, which is largely some manufacturing areas. Uh, and we find those four concentrated areas uh, highly impacted as well. And as you look across all of both the industries and the occupations, we find about 57 million uh, vulnerable jobs from COVID-19 alone. And that's a combination of permanent layoffs as we see in the unemployment numbers that could be temporary furloughs as we were describing before, or just a sharp decrease in hours and pay. So somehow very significantly your job is economically impacted. And in addition to kind of the industry and occupational cuts, we've done some other cuts that show us that those who are least able to sustain the impact are in fact those who are most affected. So in terms of the wages, the average wages, almost three quarters of the vulnerable jobs from COVID earn less than $40,000 a year. If you have less than a bachelor's degree, which is about 86% of the workforce, you are twice as likely to be in a vulnerable job. Uh, the same is true by race, uh, and R Richard earlier was describing sort of 50% of Hispanics um, at risk uh, in vulnerable jobs, followed shortly after that by Black uh, workers, more, much more than average um, concentrated in these vulnerable jobs, also at higher risk on the health side of things, as well as sort of the economic and job uh, sides of, element of, of that as well. Interestingly, by gender, um, a lot of the early job impact, unemployment impact has hit women harder. A lot of this is because women have the majority of part-time jobs. This is true around the world as well as in the United States and the Midwest. And the majority of those first unemployment claims were part-time workers. They were also more concentrated in the accommodation and food services and the retail industries that we were describing before. And women make up about two thirds of the workforce in those industries. So early job impact was certainly, you know, almost 60% female. Uh, we expect that to average out and equal out between men and women as COVID-19 impact affects other industries as well, like manufacturing, construction in the sort of middle and later stages. Mm -hmm. You know, so speaking of women, <clears throat> one of Richard's findings, CEOs must demonstrate public leadership. There's been a lot written about how certain countries led by women Mm. Are perhaps navigating this crisis than some others. We're hearing about Germany, Taiwan, New Zealand, Finland, Denmark, Iceland. What do we know about why that may be? And is there an opportunity for even greater female leadership in times of crisis? Yeah, and, and I think, um, and if you look sort of scientifically at the deaths uh, and the death rate in those countries, it it does seem highly correlated uh, with female leadership. Unfortunately, I wish we had a broader sample, right? I wish there were more female leaders of countries where we could truly have a scientific distribution and understand um, how that contributes to it. I think more anecdotally, what has been really appreciated by some of these female heads of state um, is that they're coming right out there with the truth, right? So when uh, Angela Merkel 
addressed the entire country and said, up to 70% of you are going to get this virus. I think that was a real moment of uh, very clear leadership. It was not an easy, easy message, um, but they're coming right out there very boldly. They're making quite decisive um, decisions in terms of testing the whole population. Um, they're also being quite creative in terms of tech and social media usage, which we were describing before uh, with Michael uh, and the Chicago mayor. Uh, but Finland, for example, had uh, has really used social media influencers, has done a sort of story hour and a Q&A with kids to describe coronavirus and, and kind of how do you address it with children across the country. So we've seen some pretty creative approaches to this as well. But I, I do think it's been a moment where female leaders around the world have really shown in terms of not just their empathy, but also their, their truth and decisiveness. And right, right here uh, at home as well in, in Chicago, as Michael was describing earlier. I know, so Michael, yeah. what are you seeing up close and firsthand with our mayor that illuminates some of these traits? And let me say, I believe that all people can embody these traits, right? Men and women alike have the capacity to develop and cultivate these leadership styles. We'll do another program on that. But you know, what are you seeing in our mayor? I think the, I think difference is what I see with man in daily contact. She is willing to say, I don't know. I think I see so many leaders pretending to know. We don't know. There's so many uncertainties. So, and then Richard is leading one of our recovery task force committees. We started first, let's first try to understand how has COVID-19 changed the world? And what are the implications? It's not immediately try to solve everything. And I see some of, I think, the female leaders, and I learned it from, from a good friend of mine, Penny Pritzker, as well. Let's just take a break and let's just try to understand what is going on. Let's not all pretend we know, we don't know. I think Mayor Leifer is very willing to say, I don't understand what's happening and let's have a conversation about this. Let's get different perspective, very diverse perspective together in one room and learn from each other. So Richard, transparency, communication, empathy, some of this feels in some ways a remedial course in Leadership 101. Why has this caught some leaders off guard? Shouldn't we have nailed this by now? You've spent your career helping clients with this. Why is now the moment of reckoning for CEOs to demonstrate public leadership? Because the shock of this disease has been so profound. The tendency has been to make it um, binary. Either I'm a leader or I'm a follower. And we've been followers because we've been, in a way, either hesitant because we don't want to put our face out there because it's not appropriate, or because we are thinking that we don't want to confuse and that government should lead. But it can't be binary. Remember that in January, I also talked to the um, club in February about how trust started as a top-down phenomenon. Then it migrated to being horizontal about 10 years ago. And then in the last two years, it's become local. And this local thing manifests in trust in local government, trust in my friends and family, but most important in my employer. And the responsibility of my CEO to speak up at this time cannot be uh, over overstated. That, that, um, so again, we get a pass maybe for, um, letting government get things organized, getting the playing field set. But the moment of reckoning is now because we are going to start coming out. We are going to start having um, opportunity to have haircuts or thank God um, or other things. But the reality of business having to come forward in a coherent, frequent, truthful, and science-based way, all of those things. And empathetic, yes, of course. Um, but we also have to recognize we can't do business as usual. It's not going to be normal. It's going to be new normal. And new normal, you know, for Hyatt or United Airlines might be with a lot fewer people. And for FedEx or for, you know, for, 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 for uh, you know, other companies, it, it might be a lot more employees because we're going to change our business in such a way we're going to rely more on delivery and, and things. But we have to have enough sense to sketch out what is the job of principle in the next 10 years? You know, yes, we're going to live longer, but we're going to live differently. And, you know, are we going to, are we going to relocate hopefully to cities like Chicago, which are less crowded, more eco, et cetera. 
and not to terribly crowded and unsafe places. So we have to imagine this and we have to tell people and we have to let people be part of the decision. This is something else that's critical for business. Don't be Moses. Here's the law. I mean, you know, I grew up that way. <laughs> I had a dad like Moses. Uh, it, it, you know, that was it. And I, I've learned that you have to make it a more collective decision and you get a lot more buy-in that way. And, and, and people are, are going to follow and, and believe more if they feel they're part of the process. So the fifth point you made at the conclusion that the return to work is going to be the test for trust. At some point, we're going to reopen, we're going to get back to work. Someone's going to have to be a first mover, right? So as the focus shifts to reopening the economy, I'll ask each of you, what strategies or approaches are you talking about in your own organizations or you're seeing other companies talk about that you think are going to be the most effective to increase trust between you know, the businesses and their employees as they get back to work? And so whoever wants to start. Maybe I can jump in quickly. Um, you know, the first thing I would say is our, our back to work will be voluntary in nature. If you feel compromised, if you, if you feel like your situation uh, does not allow you to come back to work, whether you're exempt or non-exempt, we would not ask that person to come back into uh, an unhealthy environment. So the first protocol will be making sure that we've got all the right clearances, CDC, that in other words, there's a safe environment, we can bring people back. It'll likely only be 10 to 15% of our workforce. We got to, you know, who would have ever thought it'd be more difficult to come back than it was to get out of the, of the, of the, uh, of the offices. And so then we will test drive that. We will have social distancing. We'll have certain protocols. Most likely we would not have testing. Testing is still quite difficult. Uh, in terms of availability, probably not tracing for, for purposes around privacy, but certainly temperature checks and all of the sorts of things you'll have to put in place. We know that there's probably 10 to 15% of our workers that would say, I'm ready to come back. I want to go back into a safe environment if there's one for me to do so. So I know we're probably limited on time, but this is an important comment, Margaret. My point is, I think we also need to balance the fact that there are people that want to go back into the environment how do you do it in a responsible, voluntary basis and, uh, and do so successfully? Mm -hmm. I think we're taking a, a very similar approach. Um, we are gonna start with volunteers for those we have sent home and we have sent, in addition to, you know, of course we have you know, lots that have to go to work every day. We've got tens of thousands that we sent home, our call center reps, our marketing teams, finance, et cetera. So the, I guess the, the key way that we're doing it is employee led. Um, and what we're talking a lot about is what's the employee value proposition? Are they going to be more productive, safer, happier, more engaged at home or in the office? Um, and so to get those insights, we put out a survey like we would do on any product. We're using our design principles and how we design new products with how we design back to work. Part of that process is actually emotion. Um, and, and really digging into how employees are feeling, which groups are feeling differently. I have four children. It is very chaotic in my house. The basketball was being dribbled under the garage. So I came into the office today to do this because I knew I would be happier and more productive. Now I'm very privileged. My husband is home with the kids. Um, but you know, you really have to understand, we talk about ethnographic research. It is about understanding the environment in which somebody is going to thrive. Um, and that's an employee led value proposition. Um, and we can't do that leadership because my world is very different than my team's world. And you have to recognize that and name it. Mm -hmm. Quaylen, I know McKinsey studies this a lot. Do you have yeah. anything? I would agree. I think the same themes of make it voluntary, make it staggered so that you're easing into it over time. I hear a lot of uh, across my clients, A, B teams so that you're minimizing the risk. Of course, you're spacing, whether it's call center cubicles or other things. Um, and then I see some also interesting um, ideas around testing throughout the rest of the year. If you are only going to bring 10, 20, 30 percent of your workforce back, how do we understand the type of work, both by role uh, and sort of the nature of the work that is best done at home? so that we can be more systematic about productivity, 
what gets done in the office, what gets done at home. And so I, I know some companies are trying some very creative tests around that between now and the end of the year. And then most of all, protecting those vulnerable populations. And some of those will self-identify as we talked about um, as they opt in or out, uh, but also just making sure that some groups in particular have um, extra precautions and, and PPE as needed. And Michael, I know you're at the center of this. You know, there are a lot of vocal groups, you know, fighting for lots of different things right now in terms of public health and safety, getting back to work. Any additional insights to share? We, we looked at some uh, surveys from companies about back to work, and you almost have like a third, third, third. A third one had enough time with the family, they want to go back tonight to work. And then there's a third that really would like to go back, they want to make sure it's really safe. And then the third part will say, why would I ever go back? I'm happy, it works, I have no commute, I'm as productive. So I think there were a lot of interesting challenges, I think for companies, how to balance these three groups. Um, we clearly want that people go back to work downtown in all the neighborhoods because it thrives and it fuels a lot of businesses in this in downtown. I, I mean, I'm going to city hall every day and it's kind of, it's, it's uh, it's an eerie feeling to see all the businesses shut down. So, uh, but I think it will be a longer term going back to work, but there will be no back to normal. It is like Richard said, the new normal. And we as, as the government, it's, you know, we will try to be a great partner on this. Mm -hmm. I wanna be sure that we have so many questions that have come in through the Q and A and we've gotten to a lot of them. I'm gonna to try to just get through a few of them more really quickly. So what should companies do to gain the trust of black and brown employees? who feel that they are consistently an afterthought, and especially in this pandemic where they've been differentially impacted so much more than the mostly you know, white leadership of corporate America. We do talk about people in more privileged jobs have had more flexibility during this time. You know, We have nice home offices we could be doing this from. And, and I know, Quaylen, you've been studying this a lot, but I wanna make sure I open it up to everyone. I think well, I, I have one specific it's like, when I heard at the beginning of the crisis, the metaphor, oh, this is a storm and we're all sitting in a boat together. And that is the wrong metaphor. It's a big storm and we all sit in very different boats. And some of them are literally in different boats. Mm -hmm. um, so I think as a leader, you ha we have to acknowledge the inequality that ha existed before and COVID-19 has amplified this inequality. And I think any civic or business leader has to as well ask himself, what do I do to address the inequality? I think our brown and black communities will not listen to any leader who does not acknowledge this crisis further amplified the inequality and we have to address it independent of your business leader or civic leader. So I, I have two suggestions that are tangible. The first is I think that every company of size should try in its supply chain to have um, companies that are headed by black and Hispanic entrepreneurs. Um, and, and, and really, even if it's arguably not as efficient or whatever, we really need to help those uh, entrepreneurs and give them credit terms and give them a chance. Um, the second is, I think each of our companies should make sure that our mid-level and upper-level executives are going on to boards of community NGOs, not the Art Institute, but Project Hood, or places that are small and actually are touching 2,500 people in the South Side in Englewood in Chicago and helping literally tangibly. So I went on that board, but you know somebody else can go on to others. And, and, but I think we're too focused on the big and we have to help the smaller and scale them um, because they're the delivery guys. FedEx is the delivery guys, but they're deliver services, sorry. I would just say- um, <laughs> Thank you for you the know. clarification. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, white workers are, based on the data, 37% more likely to hold a job that can be done remotely, right? Black and Hispanic workers are much more likely to be frontline workers um, and lower average paid workers. And so we know that economic impact has been um, felt the hardest, as well as some of the health impact that we were talking about earlier. It's even more important then that on the recovery, we have a racial and equity lens uh, on that recovery. So programs like SBA PPP, even Main Street on the larger end of businesses, um, have been difficult because they are being distributed largely through existing banking relationships. And if minority owned businesses are less likely to have an existing banking relationship, then that is also not going to be equal as we start to recover economically. And so how do we insert an even stronger economic lens uh, and racial lens uh, as we recover from this will be very important. 
And maybe I just to pile on that for just a moment, you know, and again, it's not only management's responsibilities, it's boards of directors responsibility. We have a ESG uh, subcommittee to our nominating governance committee. These things get vetted very, very closely. Uh, back to Richard's comment about things you can do. We have a purposeful uh, program in place that identifies uh, minority owned businesses, female owned businesses. It gets scrutinized every single quarter. We have a diversity and inclusion officer. We validate compensation, promotions, titles on a, on a global basis to make sure that we're in compliance. But my, my point of maybe sharing this with you is if you don't if you don't have a diverse board, if you don't have a diverse management team, if you're not a diverse company, we all know you will fail as an employer, you will fail as a customer service provider to your customers. But boards need to be equally held accountable. And I would say that we are very proud of our board's commitment and the and the cooperation that we have with the board to try to get to the best solution. Is we have two minutes left. So the trust barometers show that more than two thirds of respondents believe this pandemic will result in valuable innovations and improvements in how we work. I think many of us can see this as potentially a tremendous gift in a real opportunity. So I'd like you each just quick 20 seconds. What do you think is the greatest gift or positive unintended consequence or innovation that's going to be coming out of this? Uh, Maybe I'll, I'll just go first. And, and, and what I would say is this, I think there was always a question, could you get the same level of productivity and the same quality of work from people that weren't working in the office? I think that's an old stereotype. I think it's an old World War II mindset. Everyone's got to be, you know, butts in chairs in order to do the jobs. And what we have just proven to ourselves is that's not true. And I loved Michael's a third, a third, a third. I think a third want to be here and do their work in the office. I think a third want the choice to swing back and forth. And I think a third said, you know what, I can do my best work sitting right here at the house. Brief. I, I, would say, I ahead, couldn't Brief. agree more. Um, and again, we grew up out of a, a leader with a Marine <laughs> background. And so we over the years have had some very, um, and again, I, I've, I'm probably a different gener. I am a different generation than a lot of our leaders. So, you know, a very different perspective, but we've had some interesting debates. And I think to Dan's point, the facts have proven themselves. And I think that work from home is certainly going to change how we operate. I think obviously two other insights from the greatest gift for me, it was time as a working mom, you know, Monday to Friday has been um, something like I've never experienced in my career from a pace of work, but the reality is, is my kids don't have their basketball, soccer, um, and that has been a real um, wonderful experience. And I, it's for those of us who have had that opportunity, I am um, grateful for it. I think in the world of e-commerce, you are going to see things you never imagined. Um, we are working on a robot that's going to deliver, you know, pizzas and groceries to your home. Um, the demand for, it's called Roxo, Google it, we're very excited. Um, you're going to see some incredible innovation in the world of e-commerce and robotics coming together because in April, 25% of what we bought, we bought online. That is going to change the world of retail um, and I don't think we're ever going back. So I, I think we're gonna have some very interesting innovations in this space of e-commerce as a result as well. Yeah. I would say greater focus on what really matters to each of us uh, in terms of health and those who are close to you. And then agree with Bree at more time with the family, less time on planes and uh, in other cities. Michael. I think it's Chicago showing again that it's best business leaders are civic leaders too. And I'm just always impressed by leaders like Richard and other folks who called me and say, how can I help? I want to help. My company wants to think its expertise to make Chicago an even better place. And I'm very grateful. And I think that's is the fabric and the DNA of Chicago. And I'm glad that also the new generation of leader is following that model. And Richard, what about you? So last word, um, for me, it's that um, you get trust through the truth. And um, it may be hard and it may be uncomfortable, but it has to be based on facts. It has to be based on science. It has to be based on sources. Um, has to be based on actions. And in particular, I would hope that all of us think about how we can reconceive our businesses to help the disadvantaged, because we now have 30 million Americans who are unemployed. And 
we can't wish and hope that away. We have to have some way of making sure that they're okay. Um, I'm so proud that we're working with Unilever on a thing called Day of Service on May 21st, where they're giving away all products made in all of their factories on that one day. And that's just so damn impressive. And it shows that the private sector has just a conviction and, and give hope. That, that, that's what we have to give, hope based on fact and truth. And we can get through this. My, we all got benefit of parents who went through World War II and all this, and, and we can get through this for sure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bree, Dan, Michael, Quaylen, Richard, and the Edelman team for sharing these insights. Thank all of our members and guests for joining us. Fifth Third for sponsoring. I wish you all well. Wash your hands. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody.